There are two versions of this video, the short version that you're watching now and a longer version on Transport Evolved Take 2. Hop on over there if you'd like to watch us get into some more chewy depth, otherwise stay here for the tighter, more bite-sized cut. A little while back we added a land acknowledgement to our credits. It represents something that is very important to us as a team. But today, for obvious reasons, it's important to start with it. So before we get into the video today, Transport Evolved acknowledges that we live and work on land stolen from indigenous nations. Our head office is located on the ancestral lands of the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde. But today we're recording from the land of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which includes the Squawkson Island Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. We recognize the traditional custodians of these lands and pay respect to elders past and present. One of the things that we talk about a lot on this channel is the importance of making sure our transition to cleaner transportation is one that everyone can be a part of. That it's vital that low carbon vehicles and the huge benefits of reduced air pollution reach those who've historically borne the brunt of the worst excesses from fossil fuel extraction. But today we're going to chat with someone who's actually making that transition happen. But before we get started, don't forget to hit subscribe and hit the notification bell. It really helps us when the YouTube algorithm knows that you love us. And if you want to support the channel, hang out until the credits when I'll tell you how you can support the channel from just one dollar a month. That's just two fancy coffees a year. Okay, on with the chat. Today we're lucky enough to be joined by Bob Blake, a citizen of the Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota, he's the owner of Solar Bear and the executive director at Native Sun Community Power Development. And as the leader of Native Sun Community Power Development, he has spearheaded the development of the inter-tribal EV charging network, a network that recently received a federal grant of 6.67 million dollars. First up, thank you so much for joining us today. Perhaps the first question is what is the inter-tribal EV charging network? Oh yeah, Th thank you for having me. Um, uh, yes, the um, Electric vehicle uh, intertribal uh, EV charging network is uh, basically a network of charging stations uh, running from the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis, up to the uh, Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota, out to Standing Rock, uh, down into South Dakota through the Lewis and um, Clark uh, kind of trail, and back up to uh, uh, the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis. And um, what gave you the idea to create that kind of network? Oh boy, it was the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline in uh, Line 3. It was those pipelines that were, um, you know, um, I, I guess uh, you could say that Standing Rock and Red Lake was in the news uh, for um, opposing uh, the oil pipelines. And um, we just thought that... Uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, create an electric vehicle charging network pipeline and <laughs> kind of as a uh, kind of as a, um, you know, um, of another form of resistance, I guess you can say to the uh, oil corporation to the oil corporations. And uh, that was uh, just the idea around this. And we also kind of thought that, you know, that with the pandemic and everything that people are going to want to get out of the house and um, take their families on a road trip. And um, we thought, wow, this would be a great way to stir some economic development, create some jobs and um, get people out of the home. Uh, and so what better way to create uh, an electric vehicle charging network? That's yeah, that's um, it's it's really good to hear something good coming out of those pipelines, because I mean, there are many of those pipelines still being built and potentially possibly still being approved. So 
How do you feel that this relates to the resistance work that has gone on with uh, many people living in those areas? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we really, you know, at least I felt, and, and I, I, I can't speak for everybody, you know, all Native people, but, um, you know, we really felt like our treaty rights were violated. Um, we really feel like um, uh, that, you know, that, um, you know, they weren't, um, you know, respected. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it just, it just, you know, we protested, you know, obviously we went to court, uh, we challenged the pipelines. Um, and, you know, I, I just, you know, I just felt like, you know, this isn't over with, you know, we're not going to stop until these things are shut down. And, and, um, and, uh, this is just another way for us to, uh, kind of put a, continue to continuously put up that resistance and, and, and say to, to, uh, to everyone, to the public that, uh, you know, we don't need fossil fuels anymore. We have the technology to change and um you know electric vehicles are the future and we want to be able to give people a choice we want to be able to say do you want to stay in your fossil fuel vehicle or do you want to change over to electric vehicles and so um that was the big move on this that was the big idea behind this was just to say that this is just another form of resistance what kind of benefits do you see evs bringing to those communities oh wow cleaner air you know, uh, hopefully, um, I, I mean, clean, clean air is always good. <laughs> I like to breathe, <laughs> um, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and, and also too, I, I think the amount of dollars that, that we're going to be able to show, because, you know, we also have, uh, you know, vehicles in here that we're going to be able to use data from and basically show how they work in, um, extreme climates, such as, northern minnesota which we know is always cold um you know being able to show exactly how those you know those vehicles function how they drive how they operate um i think it's going to be really huge because there's this misconception out there that uh electric vehicles you know don't work in the winter time they don't work in extreme heat you know so we want to be able to show people that these vehicles do um, operate and they do work and they're just as good if not better than uh, fossil fuel vehicles. Yeah. One of the questions that does come up is that in rural areas um, the rural power cooperatives that are often in place in those areas don't necessarily have the infrastructure to build out the kind of high power chargers that we're seeing becoming more popular. Is that something that you've run into as a problem and has your experience helped you deal with that? Yeah, you know, um, it, it's it's very difficult for these rural co-ops, right? Like you said, um, you know, just to adapt to this new technology. That's why I say um, partnerships between tribal reservations and these co-ops, I think are really gonna be key in the future if we wanna be able to meet our climate goals. Um, because, you know, uh, these tribal nations are very, uh, how do you say they're very um, motivated um, to switch to renewables, um, not only because it makes economic sense, but because it makes environmental sense and it aligns with cultural values. And so, um, you know, I, I really would like to see more cl uh, of a collaboration between these rural uh, electric co-ops and uh, tribal uh, nations. And, 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 and their statistics have been shown that, um, you know, the economic development that can be created by, uh, you know, said uh, joint ventures um, is actually very prosperous for everybody in both communities. That's really good to hear because I know um, a lot of these underserved communities have suffered from a lack of investment from in their infrastructure, in, in their services, in their environment. So finding a way to provide that in a way that they are in control of is really important absolutely yeah and and i mean this is just a i hope another way that uh, we can go ahead and show how you know uh you know the, the tribal nations in these rural in these rural areas can really work together to uh, accomplish some really cool things so this is uh this is going to be a great project and um i'm really excited for the involvement um of also community partners too, because we do have money in this grant that um, we wanna do some workforce development around. Um, and so basically kind of showing them to how to do some operations and maintenance, 
right uh, of the of the of the charging stations and of course um you know the network and so um you know we hope to create some uh you know long-term meaningful jobs out of this too for for some lucky uh community members yeah i mean this is really a, an all hands on deck kind of situation we've we've keep pushing back on trying to resolve the challenges of climate change and the further we push back the harder it's going to be so managing to combine that with helping people to reintegrate into their communities is an amazing amazing opportunity yeah absolutely i mean you know this country i think we lead the world with locking up people i mean i think we have the most people incarcerated that's a terrible that's a terrible thing to have you know as a country you know and so like you know how do we best use you know our citizenry I, I think there's another way we can do it there's another way that we can um you know integrate there's another way that we can rebuild um and and you know this is go going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity that we can bring people from all over the country together we are such a divided country right now and um you know replacing this energy system with our new uh, technology like renewable energy, solar, hydro, um, you know, whatever it may be, um, you, you know, uh, doing electric vehicle charging network corridors, you know, uh, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think this is no greater way than um, to saying, hey, everyone, uh, we got this big problem. Let's just all jump on board. I mean, this is our moonshot moment right here. That actually kind of factors into one of the other things I wanted to ask, because we've seen before that communities haven't been involved in charger placement, particularly uh, minority and underserved communities haven't been involved in the locations of the chargers. And they might be, you know, in a completely inappropriate location, or they might need a large chunk of low power, like level one and two chargers, but actually what's put in is a DC rapid charger in an expensive parking lot. How has that factored into the way that you are planning the rollout of your charging network that you're working on? We've, you know, kind of pinpointed um, places that we think that we need to have the uh, fast chargers at, right? Um, it, we, we were looking at grocery stores. Um, we, we think that that's a, that's a key place to, um, to have the fast chargers at. You know, the level two um, chargers, you know, I, I think we could put in places like maybe casinos, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, not that we want people to stay there longer and charging <laughs> to, to, to maybe go inside and eat and maybe spend some, you know, on the slots. But, um, you know, we, we were just kind of thinking about, you know, strategically like where people can like relax, enjoy, um, you know, take in the, the, the community, um, maybe take a walk. So, you know, there, there were just different areas that we've been looking at. Um, and, but like the grocery stores, um, was that one that just came right to mind. Like we need fast chargers there. I think in the other areas, I think we want people to get out and like stretch their legs and kind of enjoy the site. So you're going to see these chargers strategically placed in places that people are actually going to be able to either get out and enjoy or, you know, it's going to be real quick, like say a grocery store. How are you planning to involve the community in those decisions about where they go? Yeah, so we have, I believe we have about 52 events planned around um, educating the community uh, about charging stations, electric vehicles. So I'm probably going to lose my voice um, talking <laughs> uh, to everybody. <laughs> But uh, I will be on a tour show going around touring and talking about um, the charging network and, and uh, just educating people on them, answering questions um, and um, seeing what they have to say. Well, you definitely, I think in other areas, we've seen a mixture of kind of hesitancy and excitement. There's this interest, but there's also like, will that work for me? Is that going to work for my life? it's a switch to a new technology so it's not entirely surprising and, and and that's the thing too so you know we want to be able to show people just by this demonstration project that you know this that uh, this technology works and um this is the future i mean this is it i mean i i don't want to you know tell people you know that this isn't you know not going to happen but um there are charging you know networks and quarters being planned all across this country right now and so um you know, when you got uh, big uh, car companies like General Motors that is saying their whole lineup is going to be electric vehicles, people are going to have to pay attention um, and realize that, you know, um, 
the old fossil fuel model is is just going to go is just going to go away you know yeah absolutely i think don't people don't realize how quickly after you pass a tipping point that that technology ceases to be viable so people with fossil fuel vehicles are reliant on a very expensive to maintain infrastructure that is deeply unpopular so it's quite likely that once electric vehicles pass a certain probably not that far away tipping point, fossil fuels are just going to be increasingly things that people don't want around where they're living. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and when you look at the ownership cost of an electric vehicle, um, it is absolutely staggering. I mean, there's like little to no maintenance on these things. And, you know, when every, I mean, every month I'm, I'm seeing like new vehicles that are going to be produced. I'm so, I'm sorry, fossil fuels and, you know, pipelines and Enbridge and energy transfer, um, you know, the oil companies. I mean, you are seriously underestimating the uh, public's thirst or hunger for renewable, uh, for, for electric vehicles. Um, I was actually recently watching a presentation from, uh, it was, I think it was the Department of Energy and it was, uh, a section that was led by members of the Cherokee Nation and they were talking about the implementation of their first charging hub and they'd put in, I don't know, something like five or ten chargers and very quickly they went from we need a car to we do not have enough chargers anymore <laughs> for all the people who want to turn up and charge and that that must be a real challenge like trying to balance the expense of putting that infrastructure in versus how much you're expecting that infrastructure to expand. How have you kind of balanced those two things? Wow. Um, I hope we have that problem. I mean, I really do. Um, you know, um, it, it, and, and like I said, I mean, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see this and see what happens. I mean, this is, you know, the first, you know, electric vehicle corridor here in the Midwest. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it just so happens to, you know, connect Red Lake to Standing Rock, it, you know, two of the biggest, you know, tribal nations that, you know, have opposed uh, these fossil fuel pipelines, you know, and um, it, it's just, it's just this whole thing is just going to be really interesting because, you know, so many, I guess people want this to happen. Um, it, it just, it's just that, um, I, I don't know what to expect to be quite honest with you. I really don't. Um, and I don't even know what to expect in these, um, you know, public information meetings that I'm going to be holding. I don't know what kind of questions <laughs> I'm going to be getting. I don't know, you know, what kind of opposition I'm going to be up against. Um, but you know, I, I just want everyone to know that, you know, that, you know, this, this is economic development. This is, you know, bringing dollars into your community. This is, you know, um, creating jobs. This is, uh, you know, circulating, uh, you know, having a circular economy. This is, you know, people, uh, you know, being able to feed their families. So that kind of brings me to another question, which um, is that, as, as I think everyone should be aware, all, all nations are sovereign governments. And getting different governments to agree on one course of action is really difficult. How have you found bringing those 11 nations together to plan this project has been? And, and how's that gone? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing, though, is that, see, we, we, we've got like... Native people and our tribal nations have got like years and years of cooperation, you know, so before colonial settle, you know, before colonial settlement here, you know, I mean, we, we were, um, we were working with each other and, um, and, and that was out of just because we had to survive. And, and, um, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, I think this really, illustrates and demonstrates, you know, how native people, um, are once again, sharing good medicine with each other. And we call that in our community, sharing good medicine with one another. And, um, so when, if there was something that another tribe, you know, kind of stumbled upon, they felt that it was very, 
uh, good for their community, they would bring it to the next community and say, hey, we, we're, we got some good medicine here to share with, you, with your tribe that's going to help you. And I think that this is what we're demonstrating here. That's, uh, that is such a wonderful term, the sharing good medicine. It, it's kind of antithetical to the way that um, society in, in America has worked for a long time and in the West in general is a very competitive society. So it's a really interesting way to look at the world. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I know we said sort of half an hour and we've run on to about 45 minutes. So thank you so much for your time. Um, where can people find out more about this project? Oh, yes. Um, if you go to uh, www.nativesun.org, uh, we'll be posting, um, you know, pr project updates. Uh, they'll be able to look at it um, and, and um, they'll be able to track and see the progress of the, of the corridor. So, yep, nativesun.org, everyone. Okay, thank you again. And we'll pop that link down below. If we get a chance, hopefully we can get you back and get more information as the project progresses. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two. And especially now that we're not making videos every day, go on and hit that bell so you'll be told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew goes out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Jason Bondor, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, David Janakula, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Joseph Broucher, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Raging Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Anthony Coates, Kyle Hodgson, Laura Sandborn, Rory Litwin, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylan, Matthew Drobnak, Christopher Lee Jones, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Feeling left out, you can join Patreon at the link below or show your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or if you're looking for an extra spark of joy and cheer this holiday season, then consider prancing to our merch store. We have a new set of holiday designs dropping soon, so ride the intertubes over and check them out. Links as per below. Our new video editor joins us on December 1st, and while we're super excited to have him on the team, we could also use your help to make sure he can eat and have somewhere to sleep. From just $1 a month, you can support the channel, and as the saying goes, many hands make light work. Thanks for joining me, and as always, Keep evolving!